more time. God, we come to you this morning and we, we thank you that you're fighting on our behalf, that you care for us, that you provide for the lilies of the field, how much more you care for us, oh God. We add our faith together in this room and we trust you and we honour you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, you can take a seat. Hope you've warmed up. Noah's warm. So if you're too cold at church, um, feel free to join the drumming team. And we got a big amen from over the right here. I believe that's Cam our other drummer. <laughs> but it is warm up here, I must say. What's going on? The presence of the Lord, I'd say. Can we thank our worship team? All right. How are we, church? You good? That's good. I might actually ask if we can get if those, are on, if those are on heating right now, I'm going to be very sweaty by the end of this. <clears throat> it's quite warm up here. I don't know if anyone can change those. They're just not on. Or th- yeah. Good day to wear grey. Well, <clears throat> welcome to church. For those that don't know who I am, my name is Ben, and uh, my wife and I run the young adults here at Centrepoint Church, and Pastor Russell and Nikki are away this morning. That was a test. You passed. Well done. There was no cheering, but can we just cheer now in honour of Pastor Russell and Nikki and thank them for being our pastors in case they're watching online. We have great pastors in Pastor Russell and Nikki and they're having uh, a week off um, checking out some of the beautiful parts of Queensland. So you've got me today instead. Let's hope there's that same enthusiasm afterwards, (coughs) after today. Um, I'm going to try <clears throat> begin a big topic this morning. <clears throat> we are starting a two-week series on the Bible called Infallible. And, you know, the, the theme for this year has been, uh, what's, what's our theme for 2022? Strengthen. Every series we've done this year has been designed to help us become stronger in Christ. Our last series called Unrivaled was for us to understand how unrivaled the nature of our God is, how powerful and strong His name is, so that we know who it is we're drawing our strength from, right? <clears throat> and when we, when we trust our God, when we know the strength that we can draw from Him, we can too be strong. It goes without saying that the next thing we should probably talk about is how we know anything about God at all, and it's through His Word, it's through His Bible. And that if our God is as strong as he said he is, his word needs to be as strong as he says it is, right? Because God is his word and his word is God. And uh, in case you're wanting to, um, to save you having to get your phone out and Google the word infallible, I've, done a, I've just got the definition here for you. It says, incapable of making mistakes or being wrong. Another version says, never failing, always effective. I like that one. <clears throat> and that's, the, that's what we're talking about here, that the Bible is never failing, it's always effective and over the next two weeks we're going to be doing a mini-series on a series that probably should be enormous, right, on the depth and the, the brilliance of the Bible, the strength of the Bible and how it's going to bring strength to your life, right? Because the Bible is actually the only way that we know that God is strong. It's the only way that we know He is able It's the only way that we can know anything about our God. It's the only way that you know that you're saved. It's the only reason that you're here. So I think it's probably important that we trust it, have confidence in it. Um, Because if we don't have a firm belief, a confidence and a reverence in our Bible, it's very difficult to have a confidence, a firm foundation and a reverence for God. They are one one and the same. And you might be in this room today and you're like, you know what, I've got questions, I've always had questions, I've got questions today. And you might find it difficult to commit yourself fully to God because you don't understand how the book, the Bible could really be the Word of God and strength 
to me. Well, today I'm hoping to shed some light to give you a stronger and a, a greater faith in the Bible so that you can get a stronger and a greater faith for yourself in God. Does that sound good? I'm aware it's a big topic, so we're going to need prayer. <clears throat> Would you pray with me? Holy Spirit, we come to you today. We open up our hearts and our minds. Would you speak to us? Would you reveal yourself to us again through your word? Amen. <clears throat> you know, as, I, as I've gotten older, I've noticed this pattern um, with people and myself even, in the hearts and minds of even Christians, and it's this, that the older we get, the more we experience in life. The more we experience in life, the more we think we know. And some of it's true. We do know more things. The smarter we think we get, the older we are. That's why we're pains in the butts when we're teenagers, because we've seen some things, you know? That's, that's why I was a pain in the butt when I was a teenager, because you know what? I've seen some things now. You know, you only have to look back through your um, Facebook posts or your Twitter posts a few years to realise you're probably a little bit smarter now than you were back then. And I thought I was going to make an illustration today and put myself under the bus. I wasn't going to go through anyone else's Instagram or Facebook. I thought, I'll go back through mine and show you some examples of how ridiculous we are when we're younger, right? <clears throat> I can't even show you them. <laughs> so I've decided against that today, so use your imagination, right? I'd probably be cancelled if I showed you those things today. So I thought better against it, but we do have this tendency to feel a bit smarter the older that we get. And as we get older and wiser, we tend to question things that we didn't question when we were younger, right? And from what I've observed for many people, this also includes the Bible, something we're taught in Sunday school, and we just believe that it is the Word of God. There's something in that, by the way, that we would receive the Word of God like a child, like Jesus instructs us to. But it's something that we begin to, to challenge. We start to build our worldview and our thoughts about the world. And naturally, I think this can get to a point that includes we start to think about the Bible. And you might think to yourself, wait, this is just a book, right? This is just, a, this is just paper written by everyday men. I'm an everyday man. What if I wrote a book and called it the Bible? You know, we have these kind of thoughts, you know, why should I be listening to the thoughts of, every, of other everyday men just like me? You might even question to yourself the accuracy of a book that was made so long ago in 2022. How could this book make any sense to us today in 2022? I don't know if you've ever had any of these thoughts, right? As you get a little bit older, you start to question the things that you built your life upon as a child. You could even be considered, uh, tempted to consider it a suggestion book, a book of good ideas, of good teaching, of good wisdom, right? But surely, no, it can't be the Word of God. I want to remind you today that the Bible is the living, breathing, active Word of God. The Bible is authoritative, it's inerrant, and it's infallible. And the Bible is your way to know God, yourself, and the world around you. It's the foundation of your life. It's the anchor for your soul. And it's sharper than a two-edged sword. And if you lose connection to your authority for Scripture, you are on your way to losing everything. Now, I don't know if you're in this room this morning and you've already started going down this road, you know, questioning God, questioning His Word. Maybe it's led you to a place of uncertainty, instability, a staleness in your relationship with God. Maybe your friends are questioning the Bible and they're hitting, hitting you with all sorts of questions and YouTube links and things that they've heard and read somewhere. And you might be finding that it's actually undermining your faith. It's making you question things and it's not, it's not helping your life. I want to tell you this morning that having a firm confidence in the Bible is the foundation for any follower of Jesus. Placing a high regard on Scripture will set you, understanding, set you on your way for understanding who God is, who you are, and what the world is around you is about and your purpose. Jesus said, man shall not live on bread alone, but from every word that comes from the mouth of God. And that Bible is the living Word of God and has the power to provide you with life and to bring strength to your soul. So today, I just want to help reignite your confidence, your faith in the Word of God. Does that sound good? 
because it's everything for you as a follower of Jesus. It's everything. So it's going to be interactive. I want to touch on the heart behind our challenge for the Bible, and I also want to touch on the head arguments we have as, as well a little bit, all in the next 30 minutes. Pray for me. I've got a timer here, and I'm going to rush, so I hope you're ready to listen. And I've got um, stuff to go with it on the screen for the visual learners too. So here we go. I want to go through today three reasons why I'm convinced of the Bible. Three reasons I'm convinced of the Bible. <clears throat> the first one is probably more a hard issue and, and why I think we challenge it in the first place. Number one is that the devil understands the power of Scripture. <clears throat> You know, the devil is mentioned all through the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation. And I don't know if that's something that you, you're challenging as well, whether the devil is real. Get your Bible back out again. You'll quickly start to think, okay, he's, he's legit there. I'm not going to go into all the scriptures today that, that talk about the presence of a real enemy in the spirit called the devil, but he exists from start to finish, right? And his goal is to steal, kill, destroy, and he is often referred to as the father of lies, Right? And um, if you've read your Bible, you will quickly see the devil's plan of attack. You'll see that the, f the first thing the devil went to, if he could go and take down God's people and God himself, it was to what? It was to attack the Scriptures. It was to undermine the Word of God, to distort it, to twist it, to manipulate it, to unsettle us and to cause us to doubt our God. Right there is my first evidence in my heart as to why Scripture is important, is because the devil went for it first. If you are going to take down your enemy, you're going to take down the thing that is their most powerful and important part, right? And we see this in the book of Genesis 3, 1-6, or 1-6. <clears throat> now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, you may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did, not, but God did say, you must not eat the fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. <clears throat> you will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from your, from your eyes, eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil." When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. That right there was the devil's first attack on God and on man. And it was to distort Scripture, to distort the Word of God. Because we know in Genesis 2, the previous chapter, and Eve refers to it, that God clearly said, you shall not eat from the tree in the middle of the garden, or surely you will die. Right? That was the word of God given. Right? But when the, the devil addresses Eve, he says, you surely, surely you won't die. He begins to twist it. He just wants to keep you from knowing what he knows, from becoming like him. And you might think here that Eve was silly, right? That it's obvious. How silly could you be, Eve? She gets a pretty bad rap. But this is exactly how the devil uses Scripture to deceive us. We are still exactly vulnerable to this situation as much as Eve was back then. The devil's plan is to distort Scripture to satisfy our desires. We only entertain distorted Scripture because we secretly would prefer the distorted version in our hearts, in our desires. We're at odds with something something that I want, something that should be right, something that I like, right? We, the distorted version of the Scripture can often suit our desires and our agenda much more than how it was said in the first place. Because we as people, we're so vulnerable to our desires, don't you agree? I'm going to explain to you what I mean. This week, uh, have, have you ever bought anything or tried to convince anyone you want to buy something um, that you probably shouldn't buy and how well you speak about that thing you're going to buy to prove to them. It's, yeah. I bought a Jeep recently. Um, we needed to upgrade our family car. Don't sigh all at once, okay? 
that's the re- reaction we needed today. We needed a family car and I wanted a Jeep. I got a lot of advice to not buy a Jeep from many different people. And uh, some of you are nodding, you're like, Ben, I thought so highly of you. <laughs> <clears throat> but they'd give me this advice, they'd say it's, they're expensive to repair, you've got to import parts, they're notoriously unreliable and all this kind of stuff. And, but I'm like, oh, but I really like them. <laughs> I like how they look, I like all their features, it's, it's good around town, but it's also a four-wheel drive, it's ticking all the boxes, you know. And um, I, I found myself having to try and, I, I, I'd heard the advice, I'd heard the truth, but because my desires were involved, I started to challenge the advice. I'm thinking, surely, surely they're not all bad, right? It only takes one to spoil the batch, you know, and get the reputation. I'm looking around, I'm like, I see them everywhere. People are still buying them, they're still making them, surely they're fine. And I've totally gone against all the advice that I was given and come up with a narrative and a version that suits my desires. Because the fact is, I chose the Jeep because it was pleasing to my eye, just like Eve chose the apple, right? In verse 6, it says, When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom. She took some and ate it. The fact is that the distortion of the devil here worked because it played on Eve's desires. It confronted her desires. Eve saw that the fruit was pleasing to the eye, that it was just like all the other food. She even tried to say that it was good for gaining wisdom. God would probably approve, you know, like he's, doesn't it, aren't we supposed to try and gain wisdom? We try and and say that God would be for this. It's a godly thing. He'd probably be proud of me. But right here is where Eve decided that she knew better than God. That she was infallible and the word of God could be challenged. And we are susceptible to this exact same attack when it comes to scripture and the word of God today. The exact thing. And it's likely that the only scriptures that you've ever had a problem with are the ones that are at at odds with your desires. The only scriptures that you've likely had a problem with so far are at odds with your desires. I don't see anyone challenging the ones that say Jesus offers salvation freely because it's great news. You know what I mean? It meets my desires. No one's challenging that. Right here is where we start to be vulnerable to the distortion of the devil. When it plays on our desires and something doesn't add up and I have to challenge myself rather than challenge the word... Right there is where people start looking for technicalities, differences in translation, errors along the way. You know, the only people that I know that have issues with God's word on issues like sexuality are at odds with their own desires in the scripture or have friends or family that are at odds with the scripture. We even get to the point of saying God wouldn't say that about people. God is loving and I am loving and God would want me to be, surely God would want me to be loving, right? And we're distorting the scripture. Yes, God wants us to be loving, but we're using the scripture to distort itself, to meet our desires. It's not overt. It's clever. It's cunning and crafty like the serpent, but it's been there all along. The devil did it with the first temptation of man. And guess what? As soon as Jesus started his ministry, guess who's there? The devil. In the desert, Jesus being tempted for 40 days. He is at the peak of all of his desires. He is longing for food. He is hungry. He's longing for security. He's longing to know that God is still with him. And the devil comes and plays on his desires. What does he use? Scripture. Does he use it properly or in context? Not necessarily. But he uses it because he knows it's powerful. Let's get the passage up from Matthew 4, 1 to 11. I'm not going to read this for time, but you can see in blue is where the devil quotes the Bible. He quotes scripture. He says, if you're the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. It's a reference to Moses' time, right? And then Jesus responds with it is written. The devil says, it is written. And he quotes a, a prophecy from Psalms, right? Again, we see that the devil knows scripture very well. And it's his first plan of attack. 
It was what he used first for mankind and it's what he used first for the Son of Man. So the devil believes in Scripture. He took the time to learn it very well and Jesus, though, did what Eve could, could not do. And, she said, and he said, I'm not letting this distortion pass. And he responded with, it is written, it is written, it is written. I say all this to let you know that the devil understands the power of Scripture. Why shouldn't you? If the devil understands it and believes it and will quote it, why shouldn't we? And sometimes, I'll also say this, sometimes it's not the Bible that needs to be challenged. It's you. It's me. It's our desires. This leads me to point number two, though, which we see in that scripture. If you can leave it up, um, please, Sam. Is that Jesus affirms the scriptures. Firstly, we had the devil quoting scripture. Now we see that Jesus affirms the scriptures. You know, sometimes we get caught up wondering if we should treat Scripture and the Bible as authoritative in the Word of God. But then we forget that Jesus, when He came to earth, quoted it Himself. (laughs) Have you ever thought about the significance of that? God coming down to earth to walk with people and literally quotes the words people wrote as if they were His own. As if they were the words He wrote Himself. Have you ever had that thought? It's like God could have come down and used different words. No, he used the words that he spoke through people all these years later as if they were perfectly fine for him to quote. You know, you would have thought that if the scriptures were wrong up until that point, Jesus would have had the perfect opportunity to correct a few things. He might have even avoided quoting them if they weren't right or if they weren't what he wanted them to be. But he didn't. Over and over and over again, Jesus refers to the scriptures that men wrote of him. Jesus affirmed the scriptures. Just think for a moment how easy it is for us to miscommunicate with one another. Some of the only ways that I get in trouble with people is through miscommunications over text. I'll send the wrong emoji and they'll be like, are you mad at me? I'm like, no, that was a nice emoji. Like, I'm sorry. You know, and I've had to clarify after those moments, no, this is what I meant. Do you think this was a good opportunity for Jesus, who had people write things over a thousand years before he came, to say, this is what I meant? Sorry, this is what I meant. How, like, I can't even have a conversation with any of you guys over text directly, rather than that kind of communication from heaven to earth, a thousand years, right? Jesus comes and he doesn't change them when he arrives. (laughs) He affirms them. He literally quotes them to the devil in the wilderness. He quotes the words someone else wrote as if they were his own. It's almost like they were his own. And if that's not clear enough, Jesus specifically speaks to this in Matthew 5, 17 to 18. Do not think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Jesus affirmed scripture as if he was the author himself. Now I'm sorry, but you cannot hold on to Jesus but pull apart his word. You're not going to last long down this path if you want to say, I have a relationship with Jesus, but I have a problem with his word. Because they are one and the same. We only know about the goodness of the Bible through Jesus. We only know about the goodness of God through the Bible, which Jesus affirmed. You are only saved through the gospel, which we read in the Bible, right? So we cannot say that I have salvation, but I do not have Scripture, because we only know about salvation because of Scripture. Our whole faith and foundation rests upon the words that Jesus affirmed himself. So that's my second reason. Jesus affirmed Scripture himself. I think they're more of a hard issue. I'm going to get into a little bit more of like the historical stuff now. The third one is that the Holy Spirit guided it and guarded it.
I believe that the defining train of thought that will determine your thoughts on the Bible is whether you believe it to be written by man or by God. It will change your attitude to the Bible as to whether you think it's written by people or whether God wrote the Bible. You see, and I want to refer to it as whether you think it's a man book or a God book. Not, not necessarily a book written by men, but mankind, right? Whether you think it's a man book or a God book. You see, a man book is open to criticism just like any other book. You know, you can find it on the shelves today and you can go and give it a rating out of 10 and you can write a review on it and um, you can see how well it goes on the bestsellers list. That's a man book. But a God book is different. It's not to be rated out of 10 and put on the bestsellers list for great teaching and wisdom because we believe it's the Word of God, that it was written by Him Himself and it's to be taken as the authoritative, infallible, inherent Word of God. You know, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture, everyone say all Scripture, is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness. What does this mean? It means that God used men to write the Bible exactly how he wanted it. God used men to write the Bible exactly how he wanted it. It means that over many different people, over the space of thousands of years, the Holy Spirit managed to write the most cohesive and meaningful book ever written that has not changed to this day. And it was so good that God would quote it himself when he walked amongst us as Jesus. He said, this is good enough for me. This is an account for what I stand for, for my words. I will quote it myself. So we know that Jesus was happy with at least the Old Testament, right? Because that's what was done before Jesus came. What about the New Testament? The stuff that's got, you know, the bits where we're saved in it and stuff. Do we believe that? You know, the things that were written about Jesus after Jesus had gone to be with the Father. You might be thinking this morning, Ben, you've only quoted the Bible to prove the Bible this morning. Is that what you're thinking yet? I would say there's good reason for that. Because the Bible is wildly considered the most historically accurate book of all time. The most historically accurate document of all time. The New Testament, particularly, was done so diligently that it stands miles above any other ancient document ever written. I'm going to show you what I mean through some diagrams and things. Are you ready? Anyone like data and diagrams and things? And this is for you. <clears throat> It's Jesus calling. Now, historically, right, I'm just going to give you some quick information about what you needed to make sure a document was reliable. For a document to be considered reliable, well-preserved, and that they kept their integrity, they needed to be copied meticulously, like really well and many, many times, Right? What did this do? If you had a bunch of copies of the same document and someone tried to say, no, this is how it is, it would, be, it would fall to the wayside over the majority that says the consistent same thing. Does that make sense? So if I had written you a letter a hundred times and then one of you tries to say, this one Ben wrote to you, and it's horrible, right? It's just not my character. They would say, um, sorry, there's a, there's a hundred copies that say the same thing we're going to go with the 100 copies. So the more copies you have, the more consistent the message is, right? That's the first factor in, in making sure a relevant uh, doc document is um, reliable. The second is how close that document is to the times it was writing about. How many years from the moment it's writing about to when it was copied is the other, the other factor. Are you following me? So amount of copies, amount of years is what we're talking about here. Who's heard of Plato before? Just quickly raise a hand if you've heard the name. You don't know, need to know anything he does, right? The fact that you've heard his name means that he was somebody of great 
respect and reverence, all right? He was born 425 BC approximately in Greece, and he's one of the most influential philosophers to ever live. You will probably have been taught his stuff at university or school about life and how it works, and um, copies of Plato's work, we have seven. And the first copies were made in 900 AD. 1,300 years after he was dead. I would not blame you if you wanted to question the work of Plato, and I'm not saying that's what I'm doing, right? But with seven copies, we're happy as a society to use that, to quote that, to teach that in our universities, in our schools, that kind of thing, right? The problem with 1,300 years, though, you might see, is like it's not really close to the time it was written. There's cultural problems, there's you know, all sorts of issues the longer the time gets away. Here is a table of some other um, famous books that we have, the amount of copies they had, and how much time was apart before the first copy in the moment that they're writing about, right? And so that, that's the author, the name of the book, when they were written, when the earliest copy was, the time gap. So you've got stuff up there from Caesar, the Gaelic Wars, that we had 10 copies of those, and they were a thousand years from when they happened. Can you see, see what's happening up there? They're documents that we would consider, uh, that we would talk about today, reliable, we would teach from those in history as, as things that happened, right? Where do you think the New Testament fits amongst all of this? Maybe if you've judged your education system or you know, what you find in school or university, you'd probably think, oh, they, they mustn't think it's very reliable. They mustn't think it's worth quoting as historical or accurate. So maybe less than Plato, because I've heard more of Plato in school than I have of the New Testament, right? So what, six, five? You know, maybe, maybe, maybe it's just above all of these a little bit. Maybe it's got like 700 copies and it's the best one up there. I don't know. I want to show you the, the information on the, the reliability of the New Testament. Can we show the next one? We have 5,000 366 copies of the New Testament. 5,366 copies, with the earliest portions being completed 50 years from when they were writing about, to the latest portions, the complete New Testament compiled, ready together, 225 years. That is miles above any other ancient document that we have. What does this mean? That the recollection of the New Testament is the most accurate out of all of those, that we stand on 5,366 copies of the same thing to continue its consistency, that it was done soon enough to be clear in the memory, but also to be aware of the current culture it was written in. And it was actually only written by either people who knew Jesus firsthand or knew firsthand people who knew Jesus firsthand. Does that make sense? The New Testament is by far the most historically accurate document of all time. And I can't help but think that the margin in which this sits above the rest has God's fingerprints all over it that has the Holy Spirit's hand all over it. It cannot help, I cannot help but think that he not only guided it, but he's guarded it. That if God went to all this work to make the Word of God work for us, that he's going to protect it as well, and that he's doing a good job at doing so. And you might think, well, what about translations and all this kind of stuff that's going on? I want to talk to you quickly about, who's heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls? I had heard about them, but I didn't really understand their significance until recently. But in 1947, which isn't that long ago, um, people found in some caves these things called the Dead Sea Scrolls. And in that was a full copy of the book of Isaiah, an original copy of the book of Isaiah. They dated that through all forms of dating, to be written at 100 BC. That was through carbon dating, through historical research and, accurate, and the type of writing, literature, everything took the book of Isaiah to be completed before Jesus was born, which tells us two things. 
that all the prophecies about Jesus in Isaiah were, compl- were complete, completed and written before Jesus came. So after Jesus came, people weren't sliding them in to make the narrative fit a bit better. They were written before Jesus was born. The second thing that gives us an opportunity to do is to say, I wonder how the Isaiah we found here, which was written back here, matches the one we use here, a thousand years after it was written. How well did we go at communicating, at translating the original Isaiah to the Isaiah that we have used in this text here? For those that don't know, this is the one, go back, go back. The, the one in the middle, the Masoretic text, is the book that, we, the, that was compiled that we base our current Old Testament on today. If you go into your Bible, that's what it's based off. So we have a chance to go, how well did they do? Go to the next one, Sam. How well did they do? Over a thousand years, approximately, how well did the Isaiah from the scrolls match up with the Isaiah from the Masoretic text? The answer is that after a thousand years of translation and copying, we saw 95% agreement. The 5% was obvious slips of the pen and variations in spelling. That's a thousand years. And that's the version we use today. God's hand is all over the Bible. He not only inspired it, he not only guided it to be written how he wanted it, I, I believe that he's guarding it to this very day. If you believe that God wrote the book, you better believe he's going to protect the book. And he's still using men and women today to preserve and protect his text. I believe that if Jesus, when Jesus comes back again, I reckon he'll be just as willing to use the scripture as he did when he came the first time. I reckon he'll look at it, he'll quote it, and he'll be just as confident as he was the first time. Because his hand is all over it. He hasn't left us. He hasn't left his word. He is still working on us. Right? The last image I want to show you today, and I'll get the band up, please, is an image that was made recently, and it shows a visual visual representation of the Bible as the world's first hyperlinked book. I don't know if you've seen this before. Let's put it up there. Down the bottom, you have every chapter of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. If anybody understands what a hyperlink is, is it's if you've used Wikipedia, you'll see that in every page there are links to every other page, right? Or relevant pages. So if you see the word Bible on the the page around church, if you type in church to Wikipedia, you'll see the word Bible. It'll have a hyperlink and it'll take you to the word Bible, right? It says this is saying that there is sixty three thousand cross references, over sixty three thousand cross references in the Bible, and these guys have taken the time to represent it visually. They have linked every cross-reference from Genesis to Revelation to give us a picture of how the Bible works with itself and amongst itself. I don't know about you, but I can't notice anything about the Old Testament and the New Testament being different. I can't see a pattern here that says, you know, God was working in the Old Testament and he was happy with the Scriptures then, but Paul's writings, they, they threw off the graph, they threw off the... They threw off what he's doing here. This is one of the most beautiful pictures of what God has made in his word. And I've had a bit of time to look at this and understand it properly. And if you want to go and have a look at it, you can just Google it when you get home. But this is the cohesion we see. The Bible from Old Testament to New, written by approximately 40 different authors, over the space of 1,500 years. And this is what we see. This is the cohesion we see. God's hand is all over the Bible because it's authoritative, inherent, and the infallible Word of God. Why do I tell you all this today? Because the Bible's all we've got. It's so important for us as believers And if anything's going to take you out, it's going down the road of believing that this Bible is rubbish. That it's not what God said it is. 
that it's just a book of suggestions, that I can take it or leave it, that I can take the parts I like and leave the parts I don't like. This is all we've got. It's the only way to know who God is. It's the only way to know how we fit into the picture and what the world around us needs from us. If you allow the devil to distort and deceive you when it comes to the Scriptures, you will lose your way. You will lose your way. This is the very strength for our lives, is the Word of God. This is the only way to be strengthened, is to have a firm foundation. And to me, the questions we have about the Bible, after seeing the overwhelming evidence of it, the questions that we still have and we still look for and we still try and find have less to do with actually the accuracy and the reliability of the Bible, but more to do with the desires of our hearts. The parts that we don't like or the parts that we don't understand. So we can sometimes convince ourselves it's just an old book. They're just lessons of man. And like Eve, we can start to distort the Word of God to suit our desires, to get what's pleasing to the eye, to even do it in the name of God and say this is something that would be godly to question. I want to ask you this question this morning. What was it that you came across in the Bible that made you begin to doubt? I'm not saying that you have, and I don't want anyone to start today. You know what I mean? But if that's where you are this morning, what did you come across? What was the roadblock for you? What was the stumbling block that you hit that made you say, this can't be the Word of God? It might be coming to your mind right now. What experience did you have that started you questioning the Word of God? Because in the end, it all comes down to this question. Am I infallible or is the Word of God infallible? Are my desires and my feelings and the things that I've gone through and my experiences, are they the truth? Are they the Word of God? Or is God the Word of God? And in the end, it doesn't matter how much we talk about the accuracy, the authority, the infallible nature of the Word of God, of the Bible. It will always come down to faith. It will always come down to faith. Do you know, you are always going to have questions about God. You will never have all your questions answered about God. Everyone pray. If you're, if you're older in this room, would you agree with that? You are never going to have your questions answered about God. You will always have things that you don't understand and frustrate you. Guess what? That's because He's God. He is allowed to have His mysticism. He is allowed to have things that we don't understand. Why? Because He is God. And for that gap, we say, I give my faith to this. I believe and I trust. I have seen enough. I have received enough to give God the rest by faith. And just like we do that with our relationship with our Heavenly Father, we do the same thing with the Word of God. We may not have every single question of our minds fulfilled, but for that gap, we say, I believe that this is the Word of God, that God wrote this that he's protecting this and that when he comes back he'll use it just as it is so this is still I'm just trying to lead you to that point where you say okay I'm ready to make the leap of faith for the bits that I don't get still I'm leaving that to God I'm leaving that in his hands because the Bible is inseparable from, the God, from God and the God God is the word and the word is God in the same way that you're saved by faith, by believing, the Bible works through faith as well. We believe that it is. Because, you know, we're, we're in confusing times, would you agree? Challenging times. Unstable times, socially. And I believe that as the church, we need to cling closer to the book of God, <laughs> to the Bible, than ever before. Everything in our society is trying to be undermined. Plenty of things in the Bible are trying to be undermined. And as the world tries to undermine people's identity, distort who God is, the church needs to be filled with strong, stable people who can shine the light of God to this world. 
You know, Proverbs says that a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. You know, stability is the foundation for strength. You can't do anything physically without having a firm foundation. Strength comes from stability. And I think sometimes we get caught in between whether the Bible's telling this and telling that and we get unstable. Let's go all in today. That the Bible is the Word of God. That it is the stability for my life. That it is the strength that I stand on. And let's be people who are strong for the world around us, who are strong for each other, that when the world loses its mind, that we are strong, that we are leading the way, that we are shining a light. There's nothing we need to change. We need to let the Word change us. Amen. I want to encourage you, if you haven't read your Bible in a while, find a way to get it back into your life. Read it in large chunks. Read it in its entirety. Read it over and over again. I've recently figured out that the easiest way to do that is in a group of people with accountability, with a plan. Go onto the YouVersion Bible app. Find a plan that you want to do. Add some friends on there. Do it with them together. Discuss it with them. Nobody reads their Bible because they wake up to feel like it that day. And then you do the same the next day and the same the next day and the same the next month and the same the next month until we start to question that it's even God's Word. Let's be a church that brings this into our lives, that stands upon the Word of God and shines the light that we need to shine to each other in this world. Amen? Well, I didn't come to answer all the questions you have today, but I hope it's covered how to find out the answers you need as well. Let's just pray for a moment. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you have been at work since the beginning of time. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. We thank you that you're still at work, that your Word is still alive, that it still is sharp as a double-edged sword that it's alive and breathing and authoritative and infallible we come to you God and we don't judge the word we let the word judge us Holy Spirit would you speak to our hearts would you illuminate the parts in our lives that, that need challenging, that need changing we submit ourselves to you and the authority of your word today and for everything else we give you faith. I pray that we would be a church that operates from a place of strength and stability found through a deep trust in your word. Lord, I pray for testimonies of brilliant testimonies in this house of people's lives being transformed through putting your word where it deserves. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, next, next week, Pastor Russell's going to um, close our infallible mini, it's like a mini series, it's just two weeks before we have our legacy service, our 100 year anniversary here. It's going to be a good time. Um, I want to take a moment to just um, bring to, a, to attention our offering and I want to continue to encourage you to be generous, to be a giver in the house of God, to, to add your weight to what God is doing in this world and in this community and um, see that He is faithful to you and will provide your every need as well. God, we, 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 we come to you today with our finances. We understand that this is the closest thing to our heart and today we worship you more than our words could ever say. Father, we come and we give you our finances. We say, would you bless them? Would you bless them? Whether it comes out of our lack or out of our abundance, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you stand to your feet? We're just going to worship for a moment and then Keith is going to close the service. As you rose, all of heaven held his breath.